In Your Garden by Vita Sackville West January January the 1st, 1950 Some generous friend may have given you a plant token for Christmas and you may be wondering, as I am now wondering, how best to expend it. A plant token is a real gift from heaven. It represents an extravagance one might hesitate to commit for oneself. A luxury, an extra, a treat. One has no alternative, for unlike a cheque, one cannot virtuously put it to the reduction of one's overdraft. There is nothing to be done with it except to buy a plant. Could one do better than choose the autumn flowering cherry, Prunus subhertella autumnalis? In England, it might more properly be called winter flowering, for it does not open until November. But in its native Japan, it begins a month earlier, hence its autumnal name. Here, if you pick it in the bud and put it in a warm room or a greenhouse, you can have the white sprays in flower six weeks before Christmas, and it will go on intermittently, provided you do not allow the buds to be caught by too severe a frost until March. It is perhaps too ordinary to appeal to the real connoisseur, a form of snobbishness I always find hard to understand in gardeners. But its wands of white are of so delicate and graceful a growth, whether on the tree or in a vase, that it surely should not be condemned on that account. It is of the easiest cultivation, content with any reasonable soil, and it may be grown either as a standard or a bush. I think the bush is preferable because then you get the flowers at eye level instead of several feet above your head. Though it can also look very frail and youthful, high up against the pale blue of a winter sky. How precious are the flowers of midwinter! Not the hothouse things, nor even the forced trusses of lilac, most of which I understand come from Holland, but the genuine tufts that for some strange reason elect to display themselves out of doors at this time of year. The winter sweet opens its yellow starfish against a wall, and the twisted ribbons of the witch hazel are disentangling themselves on their leafless branches. Both of these sweet-scented winter flowers should qualify for a choice with the plant token. Garia elliptica is not so often seen, though it has been known in this country since 1818. Its nickname, the tassel bush, describes it best for it hangs itself from December onwards with soft grey-green catkins eight or ten inches in length, like bunches of enormous caterpillars among the very dark leaves. Some people think it dismal, but a large bush is an imposing sight if you have the patience to wait for it. It does require patience, for it dislikes being moved, and therefore must be planted small. Also, you must insist upon getting a male plant, or there will not be any catkins. The female plant will give you only bunches of black fruits. As it will thrive against a north wall, however, where few other things will thrive, it may well be left there to take its time without occupying the space wanted for something else. January the 15th, 1950. Someone has been pleading with me to put in a good word for sweet briar. I do so most willingly for a hedge of sweet briar is one of the most desirable things in any garden. It is thorny enough to keep out intruders, should it be needed as a boundary protection. In early summer, it is as pretty as the dog rose, with its pale pink single flowers. In autumn, it turns itself into a sheer wall of scarlet hips. And on moist, muggy evenings after rain, the scent is really and truly strong in the ambient air. You do not need to crush a leaf between your fingers to provoke the scent. It swells out towards you of its own accord as you walk past, like a great sail filling suddenly with a breeze off those spice islands which Columbus hoped to find. These are many virtues to claim, but even so we may add to them. It is the eglantine of the poets if you like that touch of romance. True, Milton seems to have confused it with something else, probably the honeysuckle. Through the sweet briar or the vine or the twisted eglantine. But what does that matter? It is pedantic to be so precise. And we should do better to take a hint from Milton and plant a mixed hedge of honeysuckle and sweet briar, with perhaps an ornamental vine twining amongst them. 
The purple-leafed vine, Vitis vinifera purpurea, would look sumptuous among the red hips in October. I have never seen a hedge of this composition, but why not? Ideas come to one, and it remains only to put them into practice. The nearest that I have got is to grow the common clematis jackmanii into my sweet briar, planting the clematis on the north side of the hedge, where the roots are cool and shaded, and the great purple flowers come wriggling through southwards into the sun. It looks fine, and the briar gives the clematis just the twiggy kind of support it needs. Sweet briar is a strong grower, but is often blamed for going thin and scraggy towards the roots. I find that you can correct this weakness by planting your hedge in the first instance against a system of post and wire, and subsequently tying in the long shoots to the posts and wire instead of pruning them. Tie the shoots horizontally, or bend them downwards if need be, thus obtaining a thick, dense growth, which well compensates you for the initial trouble of setting up the posts and the wire. They will last for years, and so will the briar. The common sweet briar will cost you two shillings and sixpence to three shillings a plant, and the single plant will spread horizontally twenty feet or more. The Penzance hybrid briars are more expensive, four shillings and sixpence to five shillings each. Amy Robsart, with deep rose flowers, and Lady Penzance, with coppery yellow flowers, are particularly to be recommended. January the 22nd, 1950. It is amusing to make one-colour gardens. They need not necessarily be large, and they need not necessarily be enclosed, though the enclosure of a dark hedge is, of course, ideal. Failing this, any secluded corner will do, or even a strip of border running under a wall, perhaps the wall of the house. The site chosen must depend upon the general layout, the size of the garden, and the opportunities offered. And if you think that one colour would be monotonous, you can have a two or even a three colour, provided the colours are happily married, which is sometimes easier of achievement in the vegetable than in the human world. You can have, for instance, the blues and the purples, or the yellows and the bronzes, with their attendant mauves and orange, respectively. Personal taste alone will dictate what you choose. For my own part, I am trying to make a grey, green and white garden. This is an experiment which I ardently hope may be successful, though I doubt it. One's best ideas seldom play up in practice to one's expectations, especially in gardening, where everything looks so well on paper and in the catalogues, but fails so lamentably in fulfilment after you've tucked your plants into the soil. Still, one hopes. My grey, green and white garden will have the advantage of a high yew hedge behind it, a wall along one side, a strip of box edging along another side, and a path of old brick along the fourth side. It is, in fact, nothing more than a fairly large bed, which has now been divided into halves by a short path of grey flagstones terminating in a rough wooden seat. When you sit on this seat, you will be turning your backs to the yew hedge, and from there I hope you will survey a low sea of grey clumps of foliage, pierced here and there with tall white flowers. I visualise the white trumpets of dozens of regale lilies, grown three years ago from seed, coming up through the grey of southern wood and artemisia and cotton lavender, with grey and white edging plants such as Dianthus Mrs. Simkins and the silvery mats of Stachys lanata, more familiar and so much nicer under its English names, of rabbit's ears or saviour's flannel. There will be white pansies and white peonies, and white irises with their grey leaves. At least, I hope there will be all these things. I don't want to boast in advance about my grey, green and white garden. Maybe a terrible failure. I wanted only to suggest that such experiments are worth trying, and that you can adapt them to your own taste and your own opportunities. All the same, I cannot help hoping that the great ghostly barn owl will sweep silently across a pale garden next summer in the twilight, the pale garden that I am now planting under the first flakes of snow. January the 14th, 1951. January seems the wrong time of year to think of planting bulbs, 
but there are some which should be planted in March or April, so this is the moment to order them. I would recommend the Café Lily, officially called Schizostylus cochineer, with its pretty pink variety called Mrs. Hegarty. It resembles a miniature gladiolus, and it has the advantage, from our point of view, of flowering in October and November, when it is difficult to find anything out of doors for indoor picking. The Café Lily will cost you anything from seven shillings to eight or nine shillings a dozen. One dozen will give you a good return if you plant them in the right sort of place and look after them properly. Planting them in the right sort of place means giving them a light, well-drained soil in full sun. Looking after them properly means that you must give them plenty of water during their growing period, when their leaves are throwing up, rather as you would treat an amaryllis, the belladonna lily. You should realise that they are not entirely hardy, especially in our colder counties, but they are reasonably hardy in most parts of England. A thin quilt of bracken or dry leaves next winter will keep them safe for years. It is remarkable what a little covering of bracken will do for bulbs. Speaking for myself, I cannot imagine anything less adequate than a draughty scatter of bracken on a frosty night. Give me a thick eiderdown and blankets every time, and a hot water bottle too. But bulbs which are buried deep down in the earth will keep themselves warm and safe with the thinnest cover from frost above them. Another bulb, or corm, you should order now and plant in March is Tigridia, the Mexican tiger flower. This is a wildly beautiful, exotic looking thing. It throws only one flower at a time, and that flower lasts only one day, but it is of such superlative beauty and it's succeeded by so many other blooms, day after day, that it is well worth the three shillings and ninepence you will have to pay for a dozen of mixed varieties. A sunny place is essential, and, like dahlias, they should be lifted and stored through the winter. January the 21st, 1951. This is the time to think of ordering bulbs of the autumn flower in crocus. If the nurseryman knows his job, they will not be sent to you until midsummer or even August, but it is advisable to order now in case the supply runs out, or, to put it in more familiar language, get in at the top of the queue. We are so well accustomed to associating crocuses with spring that it may come as a surprise to some people to learn that some sorts of crocus will flower with as vernal an appearance from September onwards into November. Crocus speciosus is one that should be ordered now. It is cheap to buy, two shillings and sixpence a dozen, seventeen shillings and sixpence a hundred. I bought a dozen last year, and how lovely they were. Chalices the colour of palmer violets rejoicing my autumnal heart, coming out in September so unexpectedly to turn autumn into spring. Crocus speciosus cassiopeia comes out later, October, November. Crocus speciosus globosus in November, the latest of all. These are both a little more expensive than the type, at three shillings and sixpence a dozen. But do plant even a little patch of six or twelve in a special corner. Then there is Crocus sativus, the saffron crocus, a pinkish lilac colour. How difficult these colour descriptions are. This flowers in October and costs from two shillings and sixpence to three shillings a dozen. If you want something more unusual, there is Crocus Astoricus atropurpureus, dark violet, which in a mild winter might go on flowering into December, four shillings a dozen. I'm sorry these small things should have to suffer such gigantic names, but when you work it out, you find that Crocus Astoricus atropurpureus merely means the very dark purple crocus native to the Asturias province of northern Spain. I have by no means exhausted the list, and have not even touched on the colchicum, which many people are apt to confuse with the autumn flowering crocus. The only point in common, for those who do not want to be bothered with botanical differences, is that they should both be ordered now, for August delivery. If you do want to be bothered with botanical differences, the crocus belongs to the genus Iridaceae, irises and the colchicum to the genus Liliaceae, lilies. Confusion is increased by the fact that colchicum autumnale 
is popularly known as the meadow saffron, and crocus sativus as the saffron crocus. Owing to what we have been taught to call shortages of newsprint, I shall have to leave the Colchicum till next Sunday, when I can devote my 400 words to this most lovely and surprising race. I have no means of thanking the anonymous sender of a registered packet addressed to me, but if he should happen to be a reader of these articles, will he please accept my unspeakable thanks? He, or she, will understand. January the 28th, 1951. The Colchicums, as I said, should be ordered now for summer delivery. They are more expensive than the crocuses, ranging from six shillings and sixpence to ten shillings and sixpence a dozen. But being larger, they make more effect. A drift of them, especially in grass, is a brilliant sight in September and October. They should not be planted on a lawn, as the big leaves which appear in spring or early summer are unsightly and do not plant them where sheep or cattle graze, as they're poisonous to animals. The ideal place is an orchard, where their pink or lilac cups will coincide with the apples hanging overhead. But if the grass is rough, remember to cut it just before the flowers break through, or they will be lost to sight. The end of August is a safe time for this operation. They do not object to a little light shade, such as would be thrown by the fruit trees, but they are equally happy in full sun. It may surprise you that a bulb planted in July or August should leap into flowers so soon afterwards, and it may surprise you even more to find that when the bulbs arrive in their paper bag, they should already be showing a bleached-looking growth, rather like celery. Do not worry. Cut a hole in the turf, drop the bulbs in, two to three inches deep, stamp the turf down again, and leave them to do what nature intended. Speciosum and autumnale are both good varieties, rosy in colour. There are white forms of these also. Born Mulleri and Byzantinus are magnificent, and one of the finest is the hybrid Lilac Wonder, rather more expensive at ten shillings and sixpence a dozen. Other very fine hybrids are Rosy Dawn, bright pink, and the Giant, the softer pink. And you can also obtain a mixture of the new hybrids at ten shillings and sixpence a dozen. I do not care so much for the double-flowered kind, Autumnale, Roseum, Plenum, since I think the beauty of a Colchicum or of a Crocus, apart from the colour, lies in the pure lines of the goblet-like shape. This, like many other things, is a matter of taste. A word of practical advice. Put a ring of slug bait round each clump as soon as the pale noses appear, and be quick about it, because the pale nose of today is the full flower of tomorrow. Otherwise you will wonder how anyone could ever recommend a thing of such rags and tatters. February. February the 2nd, 1947. In response to many requests, I pursue the subject of plants that will flower out of doors during the winter months. Camenanthus fragrance, in English the winter sweet, should have a place of honour. Although it was introduced from China so long ago as 1766, it is not often seen now, except in the older gardens. And in honesty, I should warn purchasers of young plants that it will not begin to flower until it is five or six years old. But it is worth waiting for. Extremely sweet-scented, even in the cold open air, long sprigs loaded with the strange maroon and yellow flowers can be cut all through January and February. It lasts for two or three weeks in water, especially if you smash the stems with a hammer, a hint which applies to all hard-wooded growth. The winter sweet will eventually reach to a height of ten feet or more. It is happiest grown against a wall for protection but I have seen it growing into a big bush in the open in a garden in Kent. Not my garden, alas. The textbooks instruct us to prune it hard back to the old wood immediately after it has finished flowering. I obediently followed these instructions for years and got nothing but some truncated little miseries in consequence. Then I rebelled, as all good gardeners should rebel when they find their own experience going against the textbook, 
and left my winter suite unpruned one year, with the rich reward of longer sprays to cut for indoors. I fancy that this extravagant cutting will provide all the pruning that is necessary. If you are the sort of gardener that likes raising your own nursery stock, leave a couple of sprays to develop their gourd-shaped fruit, and sow the seed when ripe in a pot or pan. It germinates very obligingly. I hesitate to insult readers of the observer by recommending the merits of so well-known a plant as the winter-flowering jasmine, Jasminum nudiflorum, introduced from China in 1844. We all grow it now. I picked long sprays of it on December the 4th, when all the buds opened indoors in water, lasting for several weeks. The flowers and buds are not very frost-resistant out of doors, so here is a hint. Grow a plant of it in a large pot. Leave the pot standing out of doors all summer and autumn. Bring the pot indoors in November. Train the shoots round some bamboo canes. Stand the pot on the floor in a corner of your room. Don't forget to water it. Put a large plate or bowl under the pot or your carpet will suffer. And having done all this, you may confidently expect a golden fountain for two or three months, unaffected by the weather outside. In a mild season, the Algerian iris, generally called Iris stylosa, but, more correctly, Iris unguicularis, should start flowering in November and continue until March. They vary in colour from a lavender blue to a deep purple. There is also a white form, and are from six to eight inches high. The clumps should be planted at the foot of a south wall, full sun, in the most gritty soil imaginable. They love old mortar rubble, gravel, ashes, broken bricks. They flourish on a starvation diet, hate being transplanted or otherwise disturbed, are loved by slugs and snails, so be sure to put down some meter and bran and pick them while still as closely furled as an unbroken flag around its flagstaff. They will then unfurl in the warmth of your room. You can watch them doing it. February 1948 it is agreeable sometimes to turn for a change from the dutifully practical aspects of gardening to the consideration of something strange, whether we can hope to grow it for ourselves or not. A wet January evening seemed just the time for such an indulgence of dreams, and in an instant I found my room, which hitherto had boasted only a few modest bulbs in bowls, filling up with flowers of the queerest colours, shapes and habits. The first batch to appear thus miraculously conjured out of the air, were all of that peculiar blue-green which one observes in verdigris on an old copper, in a peacock's feather, on the back of a beetle, or in the sea where the shallows meet the deep. First came a slender South African, Ixia viridiflora, with green flowers shot with cobalt blue and a purple splotch. This I had once grown in a very gritty pan in a cold greenhouse, and was pleased to see again. Then came the tiny sea-green Persian iris, only three inches high, which I had seen piercing its native desert, but had never persuaded into producing a single flower here. Then came Delphinium macrocentrum, an East African, which I had never seen at all, but which is said to rival the Chilean Puya alpestris in colouring. Puya alpestris, I knew, a ferocious-looking plant, and reluctant. Seven years had I cherished that thing in a pot before it finally decided to flower. Then it threw up a spike and astonished everybody with its wicked-looking peacock trumpets and orange anthers and side shoots on which apparently hummingbirds were supposed to perch and pollinate the flower. And now here it was again, in my room, this time accompanied by the hummingbirds which had been lamentably absent when I had flowered it after seven years. There were quite a lot of birds in my room by now, as well as flowers. For Strelitzia reginae had also arrived, escorted by the little African sunbirds which perch and powder their breast feathers with its pollen. It is rare for plants to choose birds as pollinators instead of insects, and here were two of them. Strelitzia reginae itself looked like a bird, a wild crested pointed bird floating on an orange boat under spiky sails of blue and orange. Although it had been called Regina after Queen Charlotte, the consort of George III, I preferred it under its other name, 
the bird of paradise flower. Then, as a change to homeliness, came clumps of the old primroses I had tried so hard to grow in careful mixtures of leaf mould and loam. But here they were, flourishing happily between the cracks of the floorboards. Jack in the green, Prince Silverwings, Galligaskins, tortoise shell, cloth of gold. And as I saw them there in a wealth I had never been able to achieve, I remembered that the whole Primula family was gregarious in its tastes and hated the loneliness of being one solitary, expensive little plant. They like huddling together, unlike the lichens, which demand so little company that they will grow, in South America at any rate, strung out along the high isolation of telegraph wires. There seemed indeed no end to the peculiarities of plants, whether they provided special perches for the convenience of their visitors, or turned carnivorous like the pitcher plants. Why was it that the vine grew from left to right in the northern hemisphere, but refused to grow otherwise than from right to left in the southern? Why was the poppy called Macunii found only on one tiny Arctic island in the Bering Sea, and nowhere else in the world? How had it come there in the first place? In a room now overcrowded with blooms of the imagination, such speculations flowed easily, to the exclusion of similar speculations on the equally curious behaviour of men. The walls of the room melted away, giving place to a garden such as the Empress of China once enjoyed, vast in extent, varied in landscape, a garden in which everything throve, and the treasures of the earth were collected in beauty and brotherhood. But a log fell in the fire. A voice said, This is the BBC Home Service, here is the news. And I awoke. February the 5th, 1950 the hardy border carnation has long been popular, and with the introduction of the Chabot carnation, its popularity has increased. Monsieur Chabot was a botanist from Toulon, who, in about 1870, raised this hybrid between the old perennial carnation and the annual kind. The seeds of the original Chabot carnation are now on sale in this country, and certainly ought to be grown by every gardener who has half a dozen seed boxes to spare. There are two sorts, the annual and the perennial. The annuals are divided into the giant chabot, the enfant de Nice, and the compact dwarf. They should be sown in February or March in boxes of well-mixed leaf mould, soil, and sharp sand. They require no heat, but in frosty weather the seedlings should be protected. Do not overwater. Keep them on the dry side. Plant them out when they're large enough in a sunny place with good drainage. I think myself that they look best in a bed by themselves, not mixed in with other plants. Their colour range is wide. Yellow, white, red, purple, pink, and striped. They are extremely prolific, and if sown in February, should be in flower from July onwards. If you care to take the trouble, they can be lifted in October and potted to continue flowering under glass or indoors on a window sill i.e. safely away from frost, well into the winter. The perennial sort, which is perfectly hardy, should be sown March to June, and planted out this summer to flower during many summers to come. Those gardeners who appreciate a touch of historical tradition will be gratified to know that in the variety called Flamand, they are getting a 17th century strain, and may expect the flaked and mottled flower so often seen in those enchanting muddles crammed into an urn in Dutch flower paintings. Indeed, full of romance, not only historical but geographical, if you agree with me that there is something romantic in the thought of Provence, from which your seeds will come. Have you been to Saint-Rémy, that Roman settlement in what was once southeastern Gaul, where a Roman triumphal arch still stands, and where flowers are now grown in mile-wide stretches for the seed market. It must be a wonderful sight, when all the carnations and zinnias and petunias are in flower, staining the bistered landscape of Van Gogh's Provence in acres of colour. This is perhaps neither here nor there in an article on practical gardening, but I always get led away in excitement over the plants I recommend. I was led away also by a note in the same catalogue about petunias, a special strain grown by the nuns in a convent near Toulon. 
I've not tried these yet, but I mean to. I like thinking about those sisters in Toulon, pottering about their convent garden, saving their petunia seeds and sending them to us in England for our delight.' 